Hello, Joe. Hi. So again, we want to welcome everyone to our seminar series here coming from Andrews University Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. And uh, just a few shop uh, keeping things. Uh, students in the class, please put your name uh, in the chat along with present, the word present. Those who students who are taken uh, you know, care for co-curricular, um, put your name and co-curricular. And Dr. Randall usually has a sheet in, at the end too, so look out for that. Um, we will allow people to use their, open their mics, you know, their sound when um, it's the Q&A time, but during the lecture, please keep and mute your sound. And at this point, I have the privilege to introduce to you the person who will introduce our speaker. And what can I say about my friend, Dana? I can say a lot of things, but we will keep it short. <laughs> so one thing though that I um, became aware of again is that back in the day, just a few years ago, she was actually my TA. Uh, yes, she was my TA. So Dana is our uh, administrative assistant in our department. She also has a master of chemistry a degree and she is a math whiz. Okay. <laughs> so Dana, take it away. Thank you, Desmond. I have the honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Joe Schwartz from McGill University in Montreal. Dr. Schwartz is the director of McGill's Office for Science and Society, which has the mission of separating sense from nonsense. <laughs> Professor Schwartz has a special talent for bringing science to the non-scientist in a way that is understandable and engaging. He was awarded the 2010 Montreal Medal for Lifetime Contributions to Chemistry in Canada. As the host of the Dr. Joe Show, Professor Schwartz has appeared hundreds of times on various TV channels. He has authored 18 books, some of which have been translated into nine different languages. Here are a few of the enticing titles. Radar, Hula Hoops and Playful Pigs. That's the way the cookie crumbles. The Fly in the Ointment. Dr. Joe's Health Lab. Monkey's Myths and Molecules. And his most recent book, A Grain of Salt. I am told that Professor Schwartz is also an amateur magician and often spices up his presentations with a little magic. So I'm sure we're in for a special treat in seminar today. Well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to speak to you uh, here today. And uh, as you heard, I am a professor of chemistry. So let me start with a, a professorial story. One day, a prof was uh, lecturing and he looked out of the class and he wanted to do an impactive demonstration. So he went over to the side of the lecture hall and he picked up a bottle with a wriggling live worm in it. And he poured in a little bit of tobacco juice and the worm died picked up another similar bottle, poured in a little bit of alcohol and the worm died and did it once more with a little bit of chocolate syrup. And again, the worm died. And then he looked out at the audience and uh, said, well, what do you think of that? And one student in the back started waving his arms and said, sir, sir, I know if you drink, smoke and eat chocolate, you don't have to worry about worms. <laughs> of course, he had made the right observation but it came to the wrong conclusion. And science is all about making observations and coming to conclusions. And uh, our task here through my office at McGill 
is to make sure that people come to the right conclusions based on observations. We try to separate sense from nonsense. And as I'm sure you know, there's just a tremendous amount of nonsense out there today. Our efforts are done without any conflict of interest. We do not accept any money from any vested source. So our only allegiance is to the scientific method. Now, as your students know, uh, all science really starts with some area of research. A lot of that is in the laboratory. However, the findings have to be somehow uh, submitted to the rest of the, the world, the rest of the scientific community. There's no point in doing any kind of work if nobody finds out about it. So communicating science turns out to be just as important as doing the science in the first place. And this too is a special area. One has to work at it to know how to communicate. But unfortunately, there are people today standing on soapboxes all over the world who also work at communicating, but what they communicate is misinformation and disinformation. And unfortunately, they get to be trustworthy by a lot of people because they have learned to dress themselves in the cloak of science. They have learned to spout pseudoscientific lingo and they are getting bigger and bigger and it's getting to be harder and harder to deal with them, more and more difficult to overturn their cockamamie ideas. They are out there multiplying <laughs> and we are at risk. We are at risk of standing in a tsunami of misinformation. Now, information floods us from all corners these days, thanks to the internet. The internet, of course, is a double-edged sword. There is wonderful information available. I mean, I haven't been to a library for years. Why should I go? Library comes to me with a few keystrokes. But unfortunately, there's a tremendous amount of misinformation out there too. And uh, trying to get information from the internet is really like trying to drink from a fire hydrant. It's a very difficult thing to do. It is very difficult to separate the facts from the myths. And of course we have witnessed this in an exemplary way during the last year and a half, because our world of course has been overtaken by the coronavirus. And is so often the case when science doesn't have all the answers, and of course we don't have all the answers about how to deal with this uh, curse, the uh, pseudoscientists step in and they will have their miracles. They can cure everything. You probably have heard the notion of snake oil. That takes us back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, when snake oil was a reputed remedy for just about anything that ailed you, particularly arthritis. The idea was that snakes are soft and supple. They curve all over the place, never suffer from arthritis. So somehow they are lubricated from the inside. And if we could just isolate that lubricant, use it in humans, we would solve our problems as well. Of course, snake oil didn't work. It had no physiological effect. And the term snake oil became synonymous with sort of a, a quack remedy. Well, snake oil is still with us today although we don't call it snake oil, but there are all kinds of people out there selling what really amounts to snake oil. Alex Jones on Infowars tells us that colloidal silver is the answer to COVID and many other problems as well. Joe Mercola, an osteopath, the number one spreader of misinformation on the internet. Uh, in fact, Facebook just took action yesterday to ban him which was uh, which should have been done a long time uh, ago. He spreads misinformation about curing COVID with all kinds of, of uh, dietary supplements. And then we have people who claim masks don't work, or at least we should stay away from masks, using ridiculous arguments. As you can see this lady in Florida who argues that, that uh, you should not wear masks the same reason that she doesn't wear underwear because she wants all parts of her anatomy to breathe. Then we have oh. America's frontline doctors, uh, a, a totally quack organization of a handful of physicians, <coughs> but who got a lot of uh, uh, publicity when they stood in front of the Supreme Court building uh, 
in the summer and spewed out nonsense uh, about COVID uh, uh, essentially being a hoax and that symptoms can be treated simply with hydroxychloroquine and other silly remedies. Now, they didn't have that much of a voice, but the trouble is that they convinced some very high profile people. And when we have celebrities taking in this information and trumpeting out about, then we have a real issue. Madonna, for example, uh, believed uh, Stella Emanuel, one of these doctors, and she started spreading the information. You have others too. Uh, Woody Harrelson, a very good actor, you may remember him from Cheers. He thinks that COVID is caused by 5G, total nonsense. And then just last week, we had Nikki Minaj, mm. who told us about her cousin's friend whose testicles were swollen. Why? Because he had just had the COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. This is just absolutely silly stuff that, that needs to be squashed. And then, of course, we have the ivermectin uh, promoters. Ivermectin is a very interesting uh, medication. It works against parasites. It is very often used in animals. It is used uh, in some areas of the world, too, where uh, humans get infected with parasites. Uh, but uh, there is no significant evidence that it does have uh, uh, any effect on, on humans. And yet the bloggers will tell you that uh, the government is trying to even hide this effect that, that the uh, immigrants who are being taken in now from uh, Afghanistan are getting the ivermectin where the American population is not. Well, this of course is total disinformation. Yes, these people are getting ivermectin because of a suspicion that may, they may have parasitic infections nothing to do with, with COVID. But this has taken on such a life that people have stripped veterinary supply stores of ivermectin and they're hounding doctors for prescriptions. What does science tell us? And now we have a large number of studies that have been done, scientific studies, which have shown that unfortunately ivermectin doesn't work. I wish I could tell you that it did. It would be great if we had such a simple solution to such a complex problem, but the proper randomized controlled double-blind trials have come up with negative evidence. In India, uh, they have tried homeopathic remedy against the coronavirus. A homeopathy, if you're not familiar with it, is the most absurd of all the alternative remedies because it relies on non-existent molecules having an existing effect. In homeopathy, a substance is diluted, 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 diluted a hundredfold each time. By the time we've done this 12 times, there isn't a single molecule of the original uh, left, even though there's no evidence that the original would have any effect in the first place either. This is a 200 year old bit of, of, of nonsense, and yet uh, it is still with us. What are you getting when you're taking a homeopathic remedy for COVID or for any, anything else? Basically, all you're getting is water because it has been diluted to such an extent that there's nothing left. But you are getting something else. What you're getting with that dose of water is a dose of placebo because there's a very strong relationship between the body and the mind. And uh, if you think that it is going to help with your symptoms, well, it may in the sense that your perception of the symptoms will change. But the fact is that placebos do not cure viral infections. They may make you think that you are better because you may feel that your symptoms have abated. The mind has a very, very strong effect uh, on the body. We have other nonsense out there today too, dealing with COVID. For example, chlorine dioxide. Some of you may be familiar with this because it is a widely used disinfectant. And it is sold on the internet in a very interesting way. Uh, you have two solutions that you have to combine in order to uh, produce the chlorine dioxide. And this so-called remedy is what Trump heard about when he made his famous nonsensical speech about <laughs> treating COVID-19 with a disinfectant. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, totally ridiculous. But of course, the companies that sold disinfectants, believe it or not, actually had to put out press releases suggesting that their product was not intended to use internally. 
uh, the president of the United States, of course, who has no scientific knowledge whatsoever, uh, certainly this one didn't, but he was recommending this silliness. Well, how do we know that this is nonsense? We know it because of the chemistry that is involved. We know what chlorine dioxide is. We know what it can do. It is used, of course, to disinfect water. It's used to disinfect or to at least uh, bleach pulp and pulp and paper mills. But you don't put this into your body because the chemistry then is, is all wrong. Now, some of you will probably realize that as soon as we mention chemistry to the general public, uh, their, their eyebrows start to be raised because to so many people, chemists are the evil scientists locked up in laboratories, just thinking about what new cancer-causing food that have to unleash on an unsuspecting public. They think that we're a totally different breed. <laughs> Why? Because they read books like The Body Toxic about the hazardous chemistry of everyday life. They think that chemistry is the work of the devil. Whereas uh, I actually think that uh, chemistry should be in the limelight because it is the most basic of all sciences. It is a science that ties all the other sciences together. Because if you have an understanding and a feel for what molecules are all about and the kind of reactions in which they can engage, you have a pretty good feel for what can reasonably happen in life and what cannot. Now, of course, there are all kinds of beliefs out there, general public about chemistry and about chemicals. And when you use the term chemical, it unfortunately often is perceived to be synonymous with poison or, or dangerous substance. Well, as you know, uh, there are no good or bad chemicals. There are only safe or dangerous ways to use them. Chemicals are not to be feared. They're not to be worshiped. They are to be understood. They are just things. They don't have any minds, they don't make any decisions. People make decisions about how to use chemicals. And that's why it is so important to study this science so that you become familiar with all of the possibilities. Now, I've been in this business for a very long time, uh, communicating science to the public, uh, teaching students, both undergraduate chemistry students and medical students. And I've also had a radio show for 42 years now, which is the longest running radio show on chemistry in the history of the world. Wow. It also well, well may be the only radio show on chemistry. In the history of the world. <laughs> I, I, I can also cherry pick data. Uh, what kind of questions do I get? For example, recently, someone asked me, is tripolyphosphate a chemical? Now, you know, as soon as I hear that question, I know where our conversation is going. Because to that caller, the word chemical was synonymous with some sort of poisonous substance produced by a, a nefarious chemist in the laboratory. Well, in this particular case, uh, she had been reading the list of ingredients on a cleaning agent, which actually happens to be a pretty decent cleaning agent. And she had come across sodium tripolyphosphate, and she assumed that this was uh, a dangerous substance. Why? Because uh, it's multisyllabic and difficult to pronounce. And you know, I, I'm sure that you very often heard uh, bloggers say the expression, if you can't pronounce it, you shouldn't be putting it into your body or should, should, shouldn't be using it. Mm -hmm. But sodium tripolyphosphate is an interesting substance. And I explained to her that yes, of course it is a chemical. Everything in the world is made up of, of chemicals. And the reason that this is in there is to bind the minerals in the water that would otherwise interfere with the action of the detergent. And uh, I, I explained that this really was not a, a dangerous substance. And I think she bought the argument uh, because let's face it, if you expect to find chemicals somewhere, it's in cleaning agents. Mm -hmm. It calls me back again two weeks later and uh, I recognized her voice, but this time there was panic in her voice because she had once again encountered tripolyphosphate, but this time it was on a different label. It was on the label of a packaged food product. And I suspect that some of you recognize this 
magical food. Some of you probably consume it uh, on a regular basis. Uh, this is uh, Kraft dinner, mm. or mac and cheese. So this lady says to me, you know, I give my son Kraft dinner every day, which apparently wasn't the problem, is what is a cleaning agent doing in there? Hmm. So I explained, look, this is actually a multi-talented chemical. And the reason that is in here is because the phosphate enhances absorption uh, of water by starch. So that when your son clamors for his daily allotment of macaroni and cheese, you can produce it very quickly. Hmm. But look, there's no problem here. Any time that you take a bite of meat, you're getting more natural occurring phosphate than you would get in a dozen boxes of Kraft dinner. But I don't know if I was able to convince her this time because chemicals were okay if they were in cleaning agents, but she didn't want them in her food. And she had probably conjured up some vision in her, her mind that the craft company knew that eating their product was messy and that mothers might shy away from this because it creates a mess in their kids. So they included a cleaning agent to try to clean the kid from the inside out. <laughs> well, where, where do they get such ideas? <laughs> For example, from <sighs> like this, a consumer's dictionary of food additives by Ruth Winter. Now, I don't know this lady, but she has no business writing such a book. <laughs> How do I dare to make such a potentially libelous statement? <laughs> well, for several reasons. Let's face it, the, the chance that she's watching this presentation is pretty remote. <laughs> much more important than that, much more important, I can back it up scientifically. Because if my phosphate-fearing friend had looked up phosphate in this book, what would she find? Used in shampoos, cuticle softeners, bubble baths, bath salts, all of that makes sense for a cleaning agent. She would read further down, also used in incendiary bombs and in tracer bullets. Now she would not only worry about her kid being cleaned from the inside <laughs> out, she'd worry about him bursting into flame and disappearing, but not without a trace. <laughs> so why does she have no business writing such a book? Oh my goodness. Because she has made the most fundamental of all errors. She has confused phosphorus with phosphate. Phosphorus, of course, is used in incendiary bombs. It's a very dangerous element. It really can burst into flames. But when you join it with oxygen, you have a totally different substance. This is akin to saying, that we should have to worry about water because it's H2O and we know that H2 hydrogen is an explosive gas. Mm -hmm. Of course, this scientific gobbledygook. Uh, so people who don't have the fundamental idea about chemistry should not be writing books like this. Neither should they be blogging about chemical issues and yet they do. For example, this lady who calls herself the food babe. <laughs> She has a huge numbers of followers on the internet. Hmm. Why? Because she says very seductive things. For example, you wouldn't eat a yoga bath, would you? Well, that makes you pay attention. Why would anyone say that? <laughs> well, she has done some quote, fundamental research, which she doesn't understand and found that Subway, which now is the largest uh, uh, fast food company in the world, uses a chemical called azodicarbonamide to make the dough in their buns rise. Now, you know, the traditional way to make dough rise is by using yeast, which generates carbon dioxide. But any gas can cause dough to rise. Azodicarbonamide, when it's heated, will release nitrogen gas, which is not a problem. Nitrogen makes up, of course, 80% of, of, of air. So this is, is, is just a, a, another way of making dough rise. Mm -hmm. But she also came across information that uh, this is also the way that they put bubbles into plastic foam, which of course makes sense. That's what a foam is. A foam is, is a material that has bubbles in it generated by some gas. So when yoga mats are, are made of <laughs> a foamy material, 
you can use azo azodar carbonamide to basically blow up the plastic to, to give it a soft uh, texture. Well, she has now concocted the notion that when you're eating at Subway, you might as well be dining on a yoga mat because <laughs> the same chemical is used as is used in the, in, in the bun. And uh, she gives the impression that there are these outrageous chemists who are filling the Subway buns with azodicarbonamide. <laughs> she has even been on television on the, on the morning shows eating yoga mats, which of course, <laughs> is also a total logistical non sequitur, even in her context, why would you eat uh, a yoga mat? Anyway, the fact is that her crusade against azodicarbonamide and Subway has paid off and Subway has removed this chemical from their bread. Mm -hmm. Now there's nothing, I, I mean, I, I don't argue against that. It certainly is, is not necessary. Obviously you can make bread by using yeast. So it's not really a, a, an issue. The issue here is that someone was able to, to uh, carry this out by basically using pseudoscience, by implying that just because this chemical is used in yoga mats, it cannot be used in food. Uh, I mean, obviously the, the, the fact is that if you uh, use a, a chemical in one context, it doesn't mean it can't be used in another. And after all, we, we wash our garage floor with water, doesn't mean that we can't drink water. Mm. Realistically, everything has to be evaluated, not in terms of where it came from or how it was made, but what the risk benefit ratio is. And the only way we know that is by scientific evaluation. But risk evaluation is a very treacherous process. Now, of course, in the scientific realm, we rely on the peer reviewed literature. How does this work? A scientist will carry out some sort of study, often a complex study, which may have taken years of, of work by several uh, people in the lab. They will write this up send it into the editor of a journal. The editor of the journal will then send it out to what we call referees who are experts in the field, who will then review the data and decide whether or not it is worth publication. Now, of course, there very often is a lot of back and forth questions are asked. Some pieces of the research may ask to be redone and eventually the paper is either published or it is rejected. Peer review doesn't mean that the data is set in stone. Uh, why? Because people make errors sometimes. And unfortunately, sometimes they also submit fraudulent information. A classic example, of course, was that horrific paper by Andrew Wakefield over 20 years ago in The Lancet, one of the prime medical journals in the world that suggested a link between the MMR vaccine and autism. Mm. Turned out the paper, of course, was fraudulent. Uh, the uh, author, Andrew Wakefield, had concocted a scheme to defraud some insurance companies. Uh, but of course, we didn't find that out until decades later, because if you get to referee a paper, you have to assume that the data that you are being asked to review was properly uh, gathered and that all the work was properly done. Uh, you can't redo the work, of course, because this is work that, that took a long time to, to perform. So you have to assume that, that the data is, is correct. If someone is going to uh, submit fraudulent data, that is not going to be found out until someone tries to replicate the work and finds that they can't. And of course, it took about two decades until we found that that there was no link between measles and, and, um, uh, and uh, the vaccine and autism. But by that time, a lot of people have shied away from getting the vaccine and we had an epidemic of measles. Mm. So we go by the peer reviewed literature, but as far as the public is concerned, they very often turn to emotion rather than science. Let me give you an example of that. It's a true story of a group of ladies who were out one morning playing golf and a truck comes by and they feel a spray 
Now, of course, they get all upset. They, they've been sprayed by a chemical. They rush back into the clubhouse and accost the greenkeeper and list their complaints. One of them says, gee, I got a headache. Another one says, I got a rash. And the third one had the most serious complaint of all. <laughs> sure, by now you have uh, guessed the bottom line to this story. Yes, they did feel a spray and there was a truck spraying in the morning. What was it spraying? Water. But these ladies, of course, had heard about the use of pesticides on golf courses and the controversies about pesticides. And they assumed that they had been sprayed with a pesticide. So they started to have symptoms. Those symptoms were generated by the mind. But of course, nevertheless, for them, these were real. This is what we call the nocebo effect, which is the nefarious cousin of the placebo effect. Mm. Oh, that if you have thoughts that a substance can do good for you, then it actually may. Conversely, if you believe that you have been exposed to some toxic substance, even though you really haven't, the mind can play games and you can actually have symptoms. Now, this is, of course, a very interesting uh, effect because we experience it in so many different aspects of our life. Let me refer to one particular chemical, which has gotten a lot of publicity recently, uh, where sense and nonsense need to be separated. And this is a chemical called glyphosate. Uh, you may have heard of it as Roundup. Mm. It is the most widely used weed killer in the world. Mm -hmm. Why? Why do farmers use it? Because weeds are the enemy of agriculture. Weeds will suck up nutrients from the soil, which means that they reduce the yield of crops. This is why farmers have to plow the soil before planting to make sure that they've gotten rid of the of the weeds. Well, wouldn't it be great if you could spray the crops, kill the weeds without worrying about killing the crop? Well, these days that can be done because there are some agriculture crops that have been genetically engineered to resist Roundup or to resist glyphosate. Now, there are not nearly as many genetic modified crops as the public thinks. In fact, it is limited to corn, soy, canola, and sugar beets. These crops have been genetically engineered so that they will not be harmed by glyphosate. Now, of course, as soon as you introduce the term genetic engineering, people get all upset because they don't really understand what this process is. They think it's monkey around with nature, which is, is harmful because everything about nature is good and you shouldn't mess with nature. Of course, they forget that nature is potentially very dangerous. Bacteria, virus, viruses, fungi, these are all natural. Uh, you get bitten by a mosquito, you can get malaria. That's a natural insect, the mosquito. Bee sting is natural. Rattlesnake is venom is natural. The most toxic substance in the world, botulin, is produced by the botulinum clostridium bacterium, which is perfectly uh, natural. So anyway, there is a lot of, of uh, misinformation about glyphosate and, and a lot of people are worried about it, especially because they think that uh, if it is used on crops, there's gonna be residues on the food that we eat and uh, potential toxicity. And there are a lot of uh, misinformants out there who will scare people. And it's very easy to scare people. For example, by presenting them with a graph like this where you show an increase in the incidence of autism and an increase in the use of glyphosate. Now, certainly there has been an increase in glyphosate uh, without a doubt, uh, and there has been an increase in autism, but that does not mean that the two are related. This is an association and an association can never prove a cause and effect relationship. Just because two parameters run in parallel doesn't mean that they are linked. Uh, for example, 
there certainly uh, is a link between wearing skirts and breast cancer, but it does not mean that skirts cause the disease. It just means that women are more likely to wear skirts and women are more likely to get breast cancer. So of course, there's going to be an association between skirts and breast cancer, but it is not causative. Mm -hmm. I could also show you a graph of autism versus organic food sales. And this too runs in parallel because both of these have increased. But of course, no one in their right mind would think that, that uh, organic food sales have anything to do with causing autism. The bottom line here is that correlation is not the same as causation. And you have to be very careful about linking various kinds of measurements together and implying that there's a causal relationship. Now, the reason that, that um, people became so concerned about glyphosate and about potential residues in their food was because of information released by IARC, which is the International Agency for Research on Cancer, an arm of the World Health Organization, a reputable uh, group, certainly. And they concluded that glyphosate is a probable human carcinogen, which of course sounds very worrisome. But let me give you some background information here. IARC classifies substances into different groups. Group one is substances that are known to be carcinogenic to humans. For example, tobacco, asbestos would be in that category. Then group 2A, probably carcinogenic. And this is where glyphosate comes in. But let me explain what this means. This analysis is based upon hazard, not upon risk. And those two terms are not interchangeable. Hazard is the innate property of a substance or of a process to do harm. It cannot be changed. Risk is determined by the hazard, taking into account our extent of exposure. It's a very different phenomenon. I give you an analogy, which hopefully uh, clarifies this. I think we would all agree that a grizzly bear presents a hazard. It's one of the most powerful animals on the face of the earth. One swipe of its paw can take off a human head. That's a hazard. Mm. But this is an innate property of this animal. That cannot be changed. However, if you encounter a grizzly bear in a zoo, protected by a fence or by a cage, the hazard has not changed. But your risk has because your exposure here potentially is minimal. On the other hand, if you're out in the wild somewhere and you encounter a grizzly, that's a totally different situation. Here, you are at risk and you better start running fast <laughs> or at least faster than one of your friends because now your risk has increased measurably. IARC is a hazard determination, which means that they've looked at glyphosate and when exposed or when animals are exposed in grotesque doses, it can present a risk. But that's very different from humans who are exposed to very small doses. Now to underline this, what else does IARC classify in the same category of group 2A, probably carcinogenic to humans? Well, for example, hot beverages like hot tea, because mm. we have some epidemiological evidence, mostly from South America, where they drink tea, boiling hot mate tea, increased incidence of esophageal cancer. This is not relative to us. We don't drink boiling tea on a regular basis. Group 2A, barbecued meat, because compounds like heterocyclic aromatic amines or benzopyrene formed in grilling, when those are given to test animals in high doses, they can trigger cancer. It doesn't mean that your occasional steak is carcinogenic. Similarly, baked goods, bread, for example, because the baking process will lead to the formation of acrylamide in the crust. And acrylamide in animals at very high doses 
is carcinogenic. So one can say acrylamide is a hazard. You cannot change the properties of acrylamide, but exposure matters. Similarly, the profession of, uh, of working in a beauty parlor. Uh, this is also in group 2A because here, the people who work in the beauty shop business are very often exposed to all kinds of chemicals, hair dyes, uh, uh, dye, various kinds of, of uh, permanent products, uh, formaldehyde, uh, which again, in large doses in animals can cause cancer. So these are the kind of things that people worry about because it's in group 2A. But remember that this is a hazard analysis. Now, they don't worry as much about group one, surprisingly. Group one encompasses substances that are known to cause cancer in humans at levels to which we are exposed. For example, bacon is in group one. So is alcohol. And yet people don't worry about having the occasional glass of, of, a, of a alcoholic uh, beverage, right? What is really important when we are confronted with an issue like the glyphosate issue is to ask the question, not about whether or not it is hazardous, but what our exposure is, because that's what determines our risk. And this is determinable because numerous studies have been done with glyphosate, feeding it to animals, looking at cell culture studies, look at human epidemiological evidence. We know numbers here. And we can also determine to how much we're exposed by monitoring what comes out in the urine. Now let's throw some numbers around here. The acceptable daily intake of glyphosate has been determined to be half a milligram per kilogram of body weight. That means that if you take into your body this much every day for the rest of your life, there is no effect to be noted. That's what we have found from animal studies, human evidence, etc. That's the maximum amount that you can take in without any effect. Now, if you were taking in the maximum amount, which of course no one comes close to taking in that amount, but if you did, that would show up as four milligrams per liter in the urine. Well, we can measure the amount in the urine. This has been done across North America. And it is roughly about one to three micrograms per liter. That is one thirteen hundredth of the acceptable daily intake. Essentially, it's an insignificant amount. Numbers matter in science. We're always measuring things. We're always comparing one number to the other. We have to take a look at hazard and risk always in terms of numbers. Because as Paracelsus, the great sage told us about 500 years ago, only the dose makes the poison. Mm. And I can really underline that uh, by taking a look at the chemicals found in an apple. Now, most of us would agree that eating an apple is probably a healthy thing to do and we should eat lots of apples. But what are we really eating when we bite into an apple? This, mm -hmm. this is just a partial list of the composition of the apple. These are not additives, they're not pesticide residues. This is what the apple is made of. For example, acetone. Now, the last time you encountered that was probably on the label of your nail polish remover right above where it says, do not drink. Good advice, because acetone can be highly toxic. Also in that apple is formaldehyde. You know what that is? That's embalming fluid. That's what morticians use to preserve bodies. And formaldehyde is a known carcinogen. So I could tell you, gee, did you know that if you eat an apple, you're getting acetone, that that can kill you. But you know what? It's an economical way to go because you'll be pre-embalmed. <laughs> well, that might rub you the wrong way, but there's some rubbing alcohol in that <laughs> apple as well. But don't get the idea that because of what I said, okay. that that apple is going to take a bite out of us. <laughs> no. Because of course, while it's true that it contains acetone and formaldehyde, the amounts are trivial. Remember that the presence of a chemical does not equal the presence of risk. 
we have to take into account the extent of our exposure. Well, these days we can measure exposure. Why? Because we have our gas spectrometers, we have our mass spectrometers. We can find substances down, believe it or not, to the part per trillion level. You know what a part per trillion is? That's the width of our credit card in the distance between the earth and the moon. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable, we can find that. That's not finding a needle in a haystack, that's finding a needle in a world full of haystacks. Mm -hmm. Just because there is one needle and one haystack somewhere in the world, would that stop you from a good old fashioned roll in the hay? <laughs> probably, probably not, because I think it would determine that the benefits outweigh the risks. But life is full of risks. There are all kinds of risks. There are real risks in life. And then there are phantom risks. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to be able to determine the difference between them. Because no matter what we do, there are risks. You can be out for a careful walk mm -hmm. and terrible things can happen. Mm -hmm. Oh, don't worry, we're, don't worry, we're nice people, we faked it, they're okay. <laughs> but they are not the innocent little creatures you think they are. There's a risk with everything in life. But people don't worry about risks. If they make oh, the decision, to, <laughs> they don't worry about risk if they make the decision to take the risk. If the <laughs> risk is voluntary, they don't worry. <laughs> What they worry about is when the risk is imposed on them. <laughs> if they think that there's a trace amount of glyphosate in their Cheerios, which is not there because of their choice, then they worry. Of course, the bottom line to everything that I've said here is that we always have to look at the risk-benefit ratio because there are risks to just about everything. But before we decide that we're going to eliminate the risk. We also have to make sure that whatever we're replacing that risk with is less risky. Mm. If we eliminate one chemical from our life, we have to make sure that we're not replacing it by something that is equally or even more, more dangerous. But again, I emphasize that the presence of a chemical does not equal to the presence of risk. And there are a few other noteworthy items that I'd like you to go away with. The effect of a substance are determined by its molecular structure, not its history. Whether it was made by a chemist in a lab or by mother nature in a bush makes no difference. What matters is what it is, how we have studied it. Yep. We also have to make, take into account that the effects of a substance differ on the subject. So for example, children are not small adults. This is one of the first things we teach our students in medical school. And that a substance that can be very dangerous to a child when the nervous system is being formed may be totally harmless in an adult. We also have to recognize that many of our toxicity studies on, are done on rodents, on, on rats. But humans are not giant rats. <laughs> With some exceptions, of course. <laughs> Those animal studies do not necessarily reflect human <laughs> An animal doesn't feel well if subjected to a chemical, doesn't mean that it will have the same effect on humans. Oh my goodness. Even closely related animals may have different effects. For example, dioxin which is probably the most toxic substance to which we can be exposed. It's never made on purpose. It's always a product of an industrial process, byproduct. A guinea pig, very, very dangerous. However, hamsters can practically frolic in dioxin without mm -hmm. a problem. Or consider chocolate. Imagine it didn't exist. I know it's a horrific thought, but imagine it. <laughs> we decided to test it not on rats, but on the dog, because it's closer to us. Mm. Well, then we wouldn't have chocolate because dogs react adversely to the theobromine in chocolate. We can very happily eat it. And of course we do. 
<laughs> Another thing to consider that science can never prove that there's no risk associated with a chemical. We can never prove a negative. Yeah. I couldn't even prove to you that reindeer cannot fly. I suspect most of you would agree, but I can't prove it. I could take a reindeer, take it up on a tall building and nudge it off. Let's face <laughs> if that animal ever were motivated to fly, that's the moment. We'd, we'd have a man at the bottom. If we repeated it, I think we'd oh, have exactly the same effect, same result. <sighs> would we have proven that those animals today, for some reason, could not or chose not to fly? Maybe there are some reindeer, maybe eight of them, given the right weight, the right stimulation, maybe they can fly. You cannot prove negative. You also have to take into account that there are always opposing views in science, but they are not necessarily equal views. There are always opposing views on issues, for example, on climate change, but it doesn't mean that they're equal. 97% of scientists agree that climate change is real and that humans are playing a role. But the 3% who don't agree tend to be highly vocal and they can be very seductive. These days, because of all the studies that are being done, you can pick almost any position and support it by cherry picking data. Mm. But in real science, we don't do that. We shake the whole tree. We gather all the cherries and we mash them together and we taste it. That's how we come to a conclusion. And remember that the plural of anecdote is not data. Just because your neighbor says that they were cured by some homeopathic remedy doesn't mean that it was responsible. Hmm. And also in science, we never come to an absolute conclusion because certainty is elusive. Science is like a race towards a finish line and we're getting closer to it, but it always seems to be receding just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's impossible to always know the consequences of all our actions. Hmm. Who could have predicted in the 1930s when we replaced sulfur dioxide and ammonia in refrigerators with Freon, which was much safer. Um, you know, before that you had the leak of ammonia in your kitchen that was potentially lethal. We replaced it with the inert Freon. Who could have ever predicted that 50 years in the future Freon would end up in the upper atmosphere destroying the ozone layer? Hmm. You could never have predicted that. So of course we have to think about chemicals and, and chemistry. And we have to think of, of these things in a reasonable way. And of course, studying chemistry is the way to do this. Mm. Because as I said, chemistry is the fundamental science. It's what links all the others together. And this is what I've always emphasized. But it's a difficult, it's a difficult task, I can tell you. <clears throat> and I can leave you with one final example. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, my latest book is a, a Grain of Salt. And after it was published, about a week after, I, I got a call from my publisher, with, you know, elated, saying, you know, your book made it to the bestseller list. So I was very happy, you know, but I look at the bestseller list, and there was my, my book at number nine, you know, which was good. Uh, but then I look to see what else was on that list. And I find that at number five was... The book, Celery Juice by Anthony William, who labels himself the medical medium, who has a spirit guide from whom he gets advice about health and nutrition. And the spirit usually tells us that we should be drinking celery juice as the ultimate remedy. <laughs> so there he was at number five. So this of course took some of the shine off being a bestseller. <laughs> That there's a need for separating sense from nonsense oh, God. than there ever has been. And I suspect that there may be some questions that arise, but uh, I'll also tell you that in the world of science, we can never say that we have all the answers. There are some questions that no matter what, we'll never have answers. Hmm. And uh, so we race towards that finish line but we never quite get there. If you're interested further in some of our activities, you can go to our website. We have lots and lots of, of uh, uh, articles there about all kinds of, of scientific uh, issues. You can sign up for a weekly free newsletter that will appear every Saturday morning at 6 a.m. in your in-mail. Um, if you have any questions, you can always email me directly and uh, I'd be happy to, to answer.
So thanks very much for your attention. And I, I hope that I've been able to, to uh, convince you about the need of communicating our science uh, and uh, some of the pitfalls that uh, we encounter when we try to do so. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So, yes, this was very, very, very good. I'm pretty sure people have questions, so you could unmute and go ahead and ask uh, your question. Hi, I have a question. Could you say your name and yes? Oh. Hi, um, my name is Zoe Gentles and I'm a chemistry major at Andrews. So um, with the current state that um, like social media users consume information online, do you think there will ever be, or is there a way that we can currently um, 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 spread like correct information about certain scientific things in a proper way? Yeah, well, all we can do is do our best, you know, through our websites, through our talks, etc., to put out the proper information. Uh, I don't think we're going to ever eliminate the misinformation or disinformation mm -hmm. uh, because it is uh, technically not possible to totally police the internet. You know, uh, it, it, it just can't be done. I mean, there are millions of websites and then thousands and thousands of bloggers all over the place. Now, uh, organizations like, you know, uh, Facebook and, and Twitter, they, they can do something. I mean, you know, they can look for key words, key misinformation words and, and ban those, but I, you can never get totally rid of all the misinformation. First of all, because those misinformants are very clever at what they do. They know how to, you know, how to skirt the policing. And uh, so really all we can do is tell our side of the story and hope that people listen. Unfortunately, you know, our side of the story is never quite as, as seductive as the other side because we can't claim that we can cure everything. We can't say that you just take this dietary supplement and then you don't have to worry about any disease. Whereas of course, they have no issue with saying things that just are not true. Mm -hmm. So all I can say is let's just do our best. All right, thank you. I have a question as well. Um, good afternoon, my name is Anaya. Um, I was wondering, so I, there are people out there, I'm sure, like us, who really appreciate you spreading, you know, true scientific information. I'm wondering if you have had any major negative backlash from persons who maybe were benefiting monetarily from spreading pseudoscience oh, absolutely. and how that has affected um, oh, you guys. absolutely. I mean, I've had all kinds of, of I've, I've had threats, you know, to my life. Uh, by some of these uh, these people, because of course, uh, you know, I, I will uh, sometimes attack their livelihood. You know, I mean, if if, if someone is is selling uh, chlorine dioxide, uh, you know, saying that it will cure COVID, and uh, I talk against that, then that interferes with their profits, and they can become uh, very very venomous when that happens. Uh, I mean, luckily, I mean, I would say that, you know, that those kind of threats are minor compared to all the, the positive vibes. But then on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, the truth is that, that uh, I think I, I basically lecture to the converted already, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because they, uh, the people who, who believe all of the nonsense are not the ones who are going to go to our website or, you know, to listen to, to to what I say, mm -hmm. but certainly the, the, uh, I do encounter uh, people who, I mean, obviously they, they call me a, a pharmacy shill, you know, shilling for big pharma when I uh, say that we should get vaccinated. Uh, the anti-vaccine lobby is very vocal and uh, they're very threatening. And, uh, you know, they uh, say that, you know, the only reason that, if, anyone promotes vaccines is because they're getting some sort of kickback from big pharma. Uh, so yeah, I, unfortunately, when you're in this business, you have to have somewhat of a, you know, thick skin and shake off this kind of thing and just, you know, 
revel in the positive information that you get. Mm. But I mean, uh, you know, in in uh, in this game here, I mean, I'm kind of small potatoes, but. Uh, there are people who are, you know, out there, for example, you know, uh, on the internet, uh, on CNN, for example, uh, real scientists who say that, you know, they promote vaccines, etc., like, like Dr. Fauci or Paul Offit, mm -hmm. you know, who have had to hire uh, private security guards. Yep. Uh, you know, so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, these anti people are, are uh, not to be taken lightly. So I did not know the full history of that term snake oil. That was interesting about the history of snake oil and also never heard the, the phrase nocebo effect. So I've, I'm learning a lot here from, from uh, your presentation. Well, great. That's, uh, that's hopefully what we try to do is yes. to spread on the information. <laughs> Are there other questions, especially our students? Um, I see there, there are some students from a high school. Mr. Rich, do you or any of your students have a question? Uh, no questions right now, but we're really grateful that you let us join in. And I really appreciated being able to uh, be a part of the lecture today. And where are you, where are you uh, looking in from? We're from Wenatchee, Washington. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thanks Very good. for making this available. That was awesome. Yes, it was. It really was. <laughs> All right. Anybody else has questions? Okay. Well, thank you so very much. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah. Yes, this has been a good, and the, the thing too is up to today, we in one of my classes were looking at how to avoid death by PowerPoint. And yeah, you did all of the things that you should do in your PowerPoints. So not only was the content, you know, on point, but your PowerPoint also was a model. Yes. Well, I mean, presentation is indeed important. Uh, yes, it is. And, you know, visuals are very important. People remember things that they see much more than what they hear. That's correct. And this, your presentation, your PowerPoint really uh, illustrated that. Yeah, that's right, uh, Dana. Um, all of these, all of these seminars will be on YouTube. We will. Once we get it up, I will send out to everyone um, the link for our um, YouTube, the YouTube playlist. All of our seminars will be up on YouTube. All right, we want to thank our speaker again. Very, very good um, presentation, very good content. I had a blast with some of your <laughs> illustrations. But it made the point. Humor is a good way of making the point. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye bye. bye, -bye.